the last data we're going to go through is data frames. Now, blessedly, this is very, very similar to matrices. It's going to be very similar to what we just did. The only difference is that the data type is going to be a little bit more heterogeneous, right? So, I don't need to wrap that in anything because read tables default is a data frame as we mentioned before. And let's use blast results. Tab complete will guarantee you do not have any typos. Of course, do. So, not paying attention. There we go. And you'll see that it came up here. When you see this kind of style where it says some number of observation of some number of variables, it's a good indication that it thinks it's a data frame. A matrix will look like this. A vector will look like that, but with only one dimension. And scalars, it will just tell you what's in there. So you can look at this environmental thing and start to identify what kind of data types they are. This observations and variables is always going to be what a data frame looks like. Look at this. And you get a bunch of GIF. And this is really long and hard to read. So you can click on here and actually see the file, which is also equally hard to read. Or you can also get summary information as well. And where there is no numbers, it will give you names. So under query, which is the name of a <laughs> column, it's these. Very, very hard to look at these. Which is why it's very helpful to start looking at some of this stuff here, where it says observations and variables. If I knew that I, if I loaded 100 things, and it says 101, what would that tell you? What is a possible extra row? There's headers. And because we did this already, we know that we can just say and now it splits it all pretty and nice. It says all of your, your queries are here, all of your databases are here, your length, your mismatch, your gaps, it's very much easier to read. I won't go through them because there's no way for me to actually type out 12 uh, full column names without losing my sanity. But another way you can uh, add row names and column names is after the fact. You can say row names, my data, and then say where those row names are. So if this is my data, and I want to say that it's the first column, it's all rows and first column. That will define row names is a very specific type of characteristic to data frames or to matrices. This is a way of defining it after the fact. Say I loaded it and I went, oh, I don't want to reload that because it's huge. You can define it afterwards. This is a way, just like you're saying, this element equals this. Uh, you can define your row names for that matrix as any parts of it. You can also do this as a vector. If you had a vector of chain names, you can add that. Gives it a little bit more flexibility that if it's not listed in that file or you want to correct it after the fact. Yes. Of course it's not. Oh, because I already had it here. My least favorite part of R. End call, end row, row dot names, row dot name, row names. None of it's consistent to me. <laughs> so that's one I always have to look up. That's why I gave you that guy so that as an example. And I reference this section of the textbook so often because it just makes me remember how to, which which call is what. Row dot names is how you pull it in when you're loading it. Row names without the dot is a function. Um, it's just hard for me to keep straight. If anybody has tips on keeping that straight, feel free to inform me. Um, I just don't have any. So I have them written down. <laughs> and easy to find. They're actually highlighted in my copy of this because I know what I can look for it. And just to prove 
how obnoxious this can be. Row.names is also a function. And if you give it my data, it will actually print out the row names. Row names defines the row names. Row.names will print them. Least favorite part. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's something you end up using a lot. One of the nice things about data frames, and one of the last things we have to do, is the fact that these row names have actual names, like bit score. You can now use those to find things. So if I wanted to say, oh, my bit scores equal my data I can do that confusing note on this it's something to, to pay attention to this is referencing a matrix that does not have a comma this is another weird quirk if I put a comma there it won't work but if I give it a name it will give me those bit scores and you'll see one variable, 100 observations. This is just one of those weird quirks. Because you were taking a column name, you apparently don't need to give it column and row. It would normally, you'd expect this to be read. You want all rows, but just this score, that would be how you traditionally do it. But for some reason, it's that. I don't have a good explanation as to why. Again, if anybody does, feel free to share it. Does it work either way? No. Uh, I'm pretty... Oh, actually, maybe this does work. No. Uh... Oh. This is actually an interesting point. Thank you for making me try that. Uh, this, you see bit score up here, 100 observations of one variable. This is what kind of data type? Data frame. If I do it like this, this score's down here, one dimensional. What is it? It's a vector. So that's an interesting thing I didn't know. You learn something new every day. Experimentation is important. Uh, if you do this, the only thing you know, what is a special condition of a vector? Everything has to be the same type. So if you were to take a row name, in this case, this may not work. Because you can't save a row that has strings and ints and floats and bools and all of that together as a vector. It will probably complain. However, you can automatically save it as a data frame, which is probably why I learned the way I did. And I want that to move, because that's super useful.